She's April. And she's Molly. And we are the Book Besties. He's kind of a Richard Noggin. There's a woman in there who is purchasing beer. Like it's a Friday night and that girl is done. Stop intervening in my life. You don't want me in your life. Don't get in my life. Like, how exactly does one miss that there are topless mermaids on your mug? This book is not about boobs. Sorry, gang. If you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? Rashad is absent again today. Hi. Hey, you. How's it going? Oh, it's been a week. How about you? Same. Same. Molly, what, what, what is going on with your mug? (laughs) Um, (laughs) so, okay. So first and foremost, that was a gift from the Edmondsons before they left. This was a Uh mug in their house and, um, it's one of court's favorites. So I took it over. Um, I didn't realize that they were topless till I already got squared away in here. And so I just, um, Molly, you could have just gotten another mug. Like, no, I'm squared away. I am put, I'm in my room. I'm away from the tiny humans. I, I'm not going back out there. You cannot. How exactly you does one, there. how exactly does one miss that there are topless mermaids on your mug? Like, how do you, how do you, how? I was not paying attention. I wasn't paying attention this morning. I was oh, caffeine deprived, obviously. Obviously. Oh well, good morning, besties. It is good morning. <laughs> I just want to point out that it isn't early at all. <laughs> it is early in Molly time. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, oh. I know that I'm an hour ahead of you, but it's not early. <laughs> I, you forget. We homeschool now. We uh, run on a different life schedule. Like, Oh, yeah. Are you? Are your girls doing school? Like, did you start back up for fall? Uh, or So we started last year late. Uh-huh. So we started like because we pulled them around October so uh-huh. we started schooling in November so we're we just finished this past year so we're oh, giving right. them all of September off and then we're gonna start October 1. Yeah I think that's a good idea my my kids actually had open house this week uh, I also had open house for my school where I teach um, where I serve as the librarian uh, but yeah my Airplane. kids had open house this week and I have some really cool news nice. um, so James, uh, my oldest, who's a third grader this year, got moved classes. And we were like, why is he moving classes? Like, what the heck? Because he's cool. Then- well, it turned out that it's definitely because he's cool. Um, they have a new gifted math program. So it's specifically awesome. targeting math and not just like all gifted skills, but like specifically right. math. And so he got moved classrooms so that he could be pulled out for the gifted math program. That's amazing. Good job, James. I know. And then um, Sam, um, in August, October, good gracious, April, in (laughs) August, before we left for vacation, Sam had like a kindergarten readiness assessment. And they Uh didn't do that like when James was going into kindergarten. So I was kind of like, why are they doing this? I wondered if they were going to like sort of divide the kids by ability. And Mm -hmm. that's exactly what they did. And so Sam is actually in the highest group of kindergartners. That's so everyone in his class is like already over a lot of hurdles that when you enter kindergarten and they like, they know at least 17 letters and letter sounds and like they can write their name and like things that like, if you went to preschool, you may know them. I mean, not everybody because really kids right. do these things in their own time. Um, but he's in that group so that they can start teaching the kids at the level where they're at instead of Mm -hmm. trying to like just teach to the middle, which I think is a great idea. It is. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in his class is going to be labeled gifted later, or even that they're going to finish this year being ahead of everybody else, but they don't have jumping point. Right. They don't have to start teaching to the middle. They can start teaching at the level where they are. And um, I'm excited. Plus I absolutely love his teacher. um, So I'm excited about that. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Let's see here. Um, Got my MRI results back. Okay. And? I'm going to have to have a second spinal surgery. Oh, my gosh. Uh, So you have to have that. uh, Maybe end of the month. We'll see. Um, Like this month, like September. Yeah, September. Oh, wow. Um, We go. It's the third for those 
not paying attention to our recording schedule because why would you guys um they don't need to know our recording <laughs> schedule we we uh, record when we have time you just listen work. when we drop it <laughs> um i have a appointment to meet the new neuro guy no new neurosurgeon um next week and, and this they, guy like, didn't do your surgery the last time he's a new guy um completely. yeah the guy that did it last time we liked him he's mm-hmm. kind of a richard noggin and his, but his staff is like. I don't know what that means. Dickhead. Ah. Oh, <laughs> Richard right. Noggin, dickhead. Um, he's cocky <laughs> because he knows what he's like. The, the old surgeon is really cocky because he, he knows what he's doing and he's good mm-hmm. at what he does. Yeah. But he kind of runs his office like um, a middle school free gym. Like, mm-hmm. the, the, if, whatever your job is, you do. Like, you don't check in anybody else. And. His staff is just not awesome, and he runs his schedule week by week. A neurosurgeon runs his schedule week by week. And when we called to get in with him, they were like, uh, this is literally their words. Uh, we don't know his schedule next week. He may or may not be in office. We'll call you. What? I literally have a piece of the cartilage from my spine floating around and pushing on my nerves. Uh, Can we? I first can't of all, play. Gross. Right. <laughs> And painful. Yeah. We've so, already established that I don't do well with medical things. <laughs> so, like, no. So, we called another neuro office that was suggested to us by my chiropractor. Mm-hmm. And we're getting, and she's like, yeah, next week, no big. And, like, I'm explaining my history. And she goes, you're a baby. How can you have a second spinal surgery before 40? And I was like, bro, I don't know. Like, you I don't know, me. but here we are. So, <laughs> was like. Can you I slice comprehend. me open or not? <laughs> exactly. Yay, Molly. Oh my gosh, Molly, that sounds <laughs> awful. Well, the good I news like is, I mean, the good news is that for all of our besties who are listening every week and following, we're ahead in our filming. So right. there Worst might not scenario? be a disruption, but maybe Worst a case week. scenario, I'll be recording from my bed. It's fine. <laughs> oh my gosh, it'll be adorable. Last year when I had my kidney surgery, um, I had two kidney surgeries last year uh-huh. in August. Um, I was doing Zoom meetings from my bed. Because <laughs> I was allowed to work from home, do. but I still had to fucking work. <laughs> <laughs> Health concerns be damned. <laughs> So I would just like, I, I bought myself like a little like table to hold my laptop and I basically just laid down. I, I had like total like going on. I was like, I don't care. We're lucky I'm here. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Oh. All right. So, so we should probably get into our uh, book this week. It's a heavy book. Yeah. So reminder to besties who are listening, which by the way, Super proud of our following we are gathering here, Molly. Right. We have I am. we have a lot of people following us now. This is right. exciting. Right. Um I dig so it. we we are talking about banned books right now. So we talked about To Kill a Mockingbird was our first banned book. Um, and then we talked about looking for Alaska and um drama. And during that episode, we talked more about how books become banned. And this right. week we are talking about this book. All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brent, Brendan Keeley. All American Boys. And as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, this is a winner of the Walter, which is the Walter Dean Myers Award uh, for Outstanding Children's Literature. And Mal- Walter Dean Myers, for those of you guys who don't know, an uh, African-American uh, children's writer um, and very prolific in the children's world. And if you haven't read a, a Walter Dean Myers, pick one up. They're fantastic. It also won the Coretta Scott King Award. Yeah. Um, it's that's an honor. Awesome. Yeah, too. which is amazing. Like, that's a part of American Libraries Association and um, the Coretta Scott King Foundation. And just a really cool that this book won that. So mm-hmm. that's what we're talking about this week. And Molly's right. Absolutely. This is a heavy one. Um, it is. When we I were think reading it. it's important. It's an important read for sure. I was reading this one on vacation, which was not, it's not a vacation read. Guys, don't read this at the beach. This is, this is not a vacation. You're going to cry. You're going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. 
No. And you're supposed to be uncomfortable. That's the whole point of this right. book. It's supposed oh, 100%, to be uncomfortable. 100%. But definitely, if you're going to the beach, pick up red, white, and royal blue or something. Don't don't read this one. <laughs> right. Read this book, just right. not at the beach. Jasmine um, Gillian's, any of her books are great for the beach, but. Oh, yeah. The Selection, also a good choice. Twilight for crying out loud, but not this one. But this one, definitely read it. Just, just know it's heavy. Um, so I was texting Molly while I was at the beach and I was like, um this is going to be a hard episode to talk about because the content of this book is just rough so i'm going to give a a summary like we do at the top of the episodes um this book is newer than some of the other books we've covered on the pod um i wouldn't say that it's totally new i think it came out in 2015 um the library where i borrowed it from did not acquire it till 2017 and i'm super sad to see that i am the only the second person to ever check this book out which bums me out hard and makes me want to like put it on a prominent display in the library but i don't think they'll let me do that because i'm not a librarian there (laughs) it took me i got the audiobook on libby Mm -hmm. from our houston and it took me about four weeks to get it so yeah. the audiobook is doing well here, which is good. I don't know how it's doing. I got. I haven't even tried to get it in my library. I should go see if there's like a hold on it or something. But yeah, maybe try to get the English version and not the Spanish version. <laughs> I Molly. once I did it once. You didn't even go back inside. You were still in the parking lot. That is the part that blows me away. You were still there. Like. If you don't know what we're talking about, besties, go listen to Fangirl. Oh, man. That was a great, that was a great book. Okay. All right. So what this book is about. So this book is told from alternating point point of views. Jason Reynolds wrote half the chapters and Brendan Keeley wrote the other chapters. And our two main characters in this book are Rashad, who is an African-American boy, um, teenager. He's 16 or 17. Um, and then, uh, Quinn, who is also in Rashad's grade at school and they go to the same school and, um, Quinn is, uh, on the basketball team with a lot of Rashad's friends, but Quinn is white. And this is important to the context of the story because we get alternating point of views of the same event. Um, and, uh, it is important that it's a perspective of one person of color Mm -hmm. and one person who is white. So basically what happened in this story, Rashad is uh, at a convenience store. He's looking for chips. He has plans to meet up with his brother to get money and then to go to a party because it's Friday night and everybody's partying. Rashad, and a specific party. They're all going to one party specifically. Yeah, they're all going to the same party. So um, <clears throat> Rashad is a part of the junior ROTC program at his school. Um, his dad, uh, is a former, uh, military, um, member. I cannot remember. And police officer. He was and a police, police officer. officer. I can't remember what, uh, branch he was in. Maybe army. army. I um, think it was army or Marine Corps. But- yeah. So he's former military and also a former police officer. And he's raising Rashad with the notion that I'm going to quote this. Um, where'd it go? Um, there's no better opportunity for a black boy in this country than to join the army. That is a direct quote from Rashad's father. Okay. So That's Rashad, is, generation. <laughs> Rashad is in the, in the convenience store. Um, when he walks in the convenience store, he notices there's a uniformed officer in the convenience store. He kind of thinks, okay, sure. Because this convenience store has frequently been, um, subjected to theft, Um, and robbery. Um, There's a woman in there who is purchasing beer. Like it's a Friday night and that girl is done. Um, Same girl. So so she's getting beer. (laughs) (laughs) And he's getting chips. And um, he puts his bag down, his, his backpack down. Duffel. Yeah. Yeah. So he could grab his cell phone out of it. And when he does that, the woman in the store trips over him. When the woman trips over him, the officer believes that Rashad is stealing the chips, that he is trying to put those in his bag, which is not what he was doing. No. He believes that the that Rashad is trying to steal and that he also harmed this woman. He grabs Rashad, throws him out the door, like literally out the door. Yeah. Through the door. Violent. 
He's very violent. Slams him on the ground, cuffs him, and continues to beat him and kick him. Broke his nose. Broke his nose. He is. He has internal he's got broken, broken ribs, internal bleeding. He is messed up really bad. So we get the story from Rashad's perspective of what happened to him. But we get Quinn's perspective as well. And here's why we get Quinn's. Quinn is not the police officer. However, he is the best friend of the police officer's younger brother. Additionally, Quinn's father died in Iraq. No, nope, Afghanistan. Was, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Um, he died in Afghanistan. And um, our police officer, whose name is Paul. No, is that his name? Yeah, I think it's Paul. Uh, or is that the brother? Uh, yes. No, it is Paul. It's Paul. Yeah. I was trying to remember if it was the brother or if it was the officer. So um, Paul is the police officer. He um, pretty much became the mentor father figure for Quinn. So Quinn is witnessing this violent act, this event of police brutality. Mm-hmm. Um, and he basically pretends like he isn't there. He runs away right. from it. He doesn't want to admit that he was there. Obviously, he's as what happens in these, right. Obviously, as what happens in these sort of situations, somebody was there filming and the film goes viral. And now the school is basically divided into sides between who believes that Paul was right and doing the right thing and he was just doing his job as an officer and who believes that Rashad is being targeted as a young black youth who was sagging his pants. And as uh, Rashad's dad always said, if you look like a thug, you're going to be accused of being a thug. And so that's the story. Um, So not a fun thing to read. Um, Definitely important. Agreed. Um, so, did you have anything to add to the summary, or you want to jump into my questions for you? Um, I think it's a good summary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think, look at my notes. So, before we dive into conversation, I want to say mm-hmm. that the reason this is uncomfortable for us mm-hmm. is white privilege. And I'm going to outright say that. I am a mm-hmm. white female who never grew up with this struggle. And that's the reason this is uncomfortable for us. And right. I think that is why this book probably is banned because people uh, of the, the the white color are uncomfortable by that. And two, it, you know, it, it highlights what's really going on and people aren't ready to have that conversation. Yeah, and I do want to also point out when we're discussing this, just like Molly said, we don't come from the same perspective yeah. as people of color who um, are experiencing this in their daily lives. And I feel like this book, even though it was written in 2015, is still timely. Very um, relevant. We talked about yes. that with To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, it's still timely because look at what just happened last year with George Floyd. Like yeah. this is still happening. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, when Rashad is being beaten, the only thing he keeps thinking is, please don't kill me. Right. So we are not coming from that perspective. However, yeah. we are going to talk about this because it's an important book. And I do think it's important. And I said this when we were talking about mirrors of kids seeing themselves in books in libraries. Um, I think it's important that we read books that make us uncomfortable so we can talk Agreed. about that uncomfortability. Um, and I think that books are a really great gateway to our country being more unified when it comes to relations with people of different colors and mm-hmm. races. Um, I didn't mention why this was book, book was banned, and I do want to say that um, in 2020, it was in the third uh, the third most banned book on the American Libraries Association list of commonly challenged and banned books um, in the United States. Uh, the book was banned, challenged, and or restricted for profanity use, drug use, and alcoholism, um, and because it was thought to promote anti police views. Oh. It contained diversive topics and it can be too much of a sensitive matter right now. And that is a direct quote. So we're talking about in 2020, when the incident with George Floyd happened, this book was challenged because right now this isn't the best book for kids to read. False. False. <laughs> I'm with you. False. My gosh. <laughs> My gosh. False. Okay, let's dive into questions and we can have a whole conversation. Yeah. 
So uh, let's talk about uh, the first two chapters of this book. So Rashad is beaten in chapter one, which right. was shocking to me. Hit right in um, the face with what happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How did you feel about the decision to jump right into the beating instead of leading up to it? Do you feel like we knew Rashad enough to believe his story? Yes. At that point? I yeah? feel like um, the writing gave us a good idea and a good scope of who Rashad was. Mm-hmm. Him talking about who he was at school, who he was at home. He, mm-hmm. you know, I I knew by before he was even assaulted that he liked to draw, that mm-hmm. he was really good at art, that he in, was in the ROTC. He had mm-hmm. very specific feelings about how his parents run their, like, I feel like I knew who, who he was as a kid. Yeah. I, I may not know his social security number and, like, his favorite color, but mm-hmm. I feel like I knew who he was as a character. Yeah. By that point. I, I also think, like, this is the amount of information that you get about a kid when right. the, when something like this happens. We don't, we we know more about Rashad than we know of the other people who have been victims right. of police brutality. And I, I want to point out, when Quinn starts telling his story, he's going to the same store where Rashad is. And he right. mentions that he is one of the people that has stolen from that store. Right. But because he's white... He it's got not a, yeah. yeah, right. Um, so I actually like the formatting of this, how we went day by day instead of chapter mm-hmm. numbers. I like yes. that. Oh, that um, was cool. It was like a little over a week that this right, happened, right? Right, and, and I feel like it was important because we're – and it's broken down from both point of views, and mm-hmm. and you can see the timeline, right? And right, you can yeah. see this running simultaneously. You can see how – both boys' days are going. Right. And I think the formatting really helps that. Yeah. And I think it's a really great dichotomy of what, like, Rashad's timeline is him in a hospital bed. Yep. Most of what happens in this story happens around Rashad, other than the incident that happens to Rashad. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's pretty uh, comparable to what happens in these sort mm-hmm. of situations. Um either the person is dead and then they can't speak for themselves anymore right? or they're hospitalized or, you know, whatever. We don't hear of police brutality ending with everyone was fine. Like right. that's not it, how it ends. It's not, Cause it's not right. cause there's always going to be opposition on both right. sides. I do think it was an interesting choice to be so aggressive and in your face and have that brutality happen in the first chapter. Um, because, I mean, it's a great choice. It was so unexpected and so right. smart. I just thought, well, we'll get to know Rashad a little bit better. Um, and, I, I mean, I wanted to know him better. But I, I feel still, like I still the, believed him. Like, I believed what he said. Right. right. I feel like the point of that, though, was because mm-hmm. that's how, like you said, that's how we get the information. Right. We don't like randomly start learning about a teenage boy on the news and then learn later he's been assaulted or he's been shot or whatever. Right. It's, you know, 17 year old African American male shot today by a police officer in Chicago because of X, like, and they go into it from there. And then we learn more information about him. And I think that's what they were trying to show us. Right, right. And I, uh, Rashad's brother talks about how they need to choose a picture to be released to the media. And he wants one, yeah, Spoonie, his brother Spoonie. And he wants Rashad to be in the ROTC uniform, junior ROTC uniform. Because they're going to be showing ones of the cop in his uniform. Exactly. Exactly. Spoonie is so clever. Because whenever they choose pictures of these uh, people, these victims of police brutality, they are showing them in a negative light. They well, always look like the they're flicking people off. They're doing right. drugs. Like it's all very imp- in- inappropriate, um, and it makes it look like, well, of course that's why they shot him, and which Spoonie, is not it's not accurate. <laughs> and Spoonie was smart. He got Spoonie ahead of this. Mm-hmm. He was proactive and it really i know it upset his parents Mm -hmm. but spoonie saw he's seen what has happened in his community yeah and he was like this is not going to happen to my little brother and he got proactive his girlfriend's what pre-law and she jumped in and like Mm 
Mm-hmm. They she like was amazing. Yes. And there's oh. an interesting connection with her and Quinn there because her younger brother is best friends with Rashad, but yeah. plays basketball with Quinn. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of connectivity going on because here. It seems like it's a small school, right? Yeah, it's so it feels like it's a small community, definitely. Yeah. I don't right. know that it is, but it feels like that. Right. So um, um yeah. Yeah. Do you think like telling this book from two different point of views of like one being a a person of color and one being a white person made it more accessible to white people? Like, I think think I I wouldn't say accessible, but I think it makes it easier, uh, an easier pill to swallow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I feel like if I'm uncomfortable because this has never happened to me. And this mm-hmm. is upsetting to me, and mm-hmm. it hurts my heart that this is happening to a child. Right. But I can't put my shoe self in Rashad's shoes. But I sure right. as heck can put myself in Quinn's shoes because right. I've seen brutality. Right. I, I I've seen violence. I've seen cops arrest people and be aggressive, mm-hmm. but I've never been in those shoes. So giving us the point of view of someone that has it's a witness. Right. It's a witness. But mm-hmm. also our version of this conversation, it's not mm-hmm. an us versus them thing, but like right. our point of view of being on the other side of the looking glass. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think it was important. I yeah. think, I think writing Rashad's story, if we had to omit one of the voices Mm-hmm. It would be Quinn's, though. Oh, I yeah, think sure. keeping Rashad's voice is more important than this book, but right. Quinn's voice is important. So, well, we when we get Quinn's voice, we're getting to know more of what's happening in the community and in the school yeah. because Rashad's still in the hospital. But um, we're at also first, I kind of in him, right? Yes, yes, and that's what I was going to say. I, I was sort of surprised at the decision to choose somebody who was an outsider of this. Like, this is a witness to it, but it's not somebody who was involved in the incident. Um, It isn't the police officer, for example. I thought that maybe, you know, including his point of view. But the truth is that what's going on with Paul, um, he's fighting for his job. And so he's lying a lot in this. And I think it's actually more impactful that Quinn comes from being somebody that's like, well, Paul's a good guy. He's He would never do this. I want to use this quote. He's not the KKK racist. He's not KKK racist. Um, it doesn't make it, him less racist, babe. <laughs> right. But that doesn't, uh, I don't think most, this is a quote from one of the young women in the story. I don't think most people think they're racist, but every time something like this happens, you could, like you said, say, quote unquote, not my problem. You could say, quote unquote, it's a one time thing. Every time it happens. happens. And yeah. that's why I think Quinn's perspective was important in this story because he's the one that brings about the change. Rashad knows what happened to him. Mm-hmm. Well, Quinn, and joining, s- Quinn joining the movement of right. supporting Rashad. You're seeing the moral dilemma of right. a white teenage boy in this right. situation. Right. And you are seeing he could have chose – to stay on Polly's side, right? Oh, he could have. He could have. Absolutely. When he got that to been the that, easy choice. First and foremost, that was ballsy them holding the picnic the next day. Right. And that quote is actually from uh, Paul's cousin. Yeah. So um, I can't f- remember her, her name off the top of my head. I can't head, either. But, um, but, but, um, but she helps organize the uh, the, yeah. the protest for but him. But he could have, the day of the picnic, Quinn could have walked up went right to Paul and his best Mm -hmm. friend, supported him and Mm -hmm. see and kept feeding the, he could have went to school Monday, feeding the party line to everybody. But he never had to admit that he was even there. He's not on the film. No, he doesn't have to even admit it. Had this sense of uncomfortableness, seeing Paul Mm -hmm. on that grill. And he instantly knew if I feel this shitty about this, this is not right. Right. And that's where that and change do, starts. And we do see a lot of that internal conflict, especially with the interactions with the players on the basketball team, because half of the players on the basketball team are friends with Rashad and the other right. half are f- friends and with And how dare that coach just say, 
let's not talk about this. Let's just yeah. leave this alone. Especially listen, when he has so many kids of color on his team. Right. Like, Listen, I understand the want to keep the peace and make everybody happy, but this goes back to what we talked about when we talked about To Kill a Mockingbird. If you are giving the kids a safe space to have those conversations and you are fostering that discussion – and facilitating it appropriately, that's how we're going to bring about change in this world. Cause it's not going to be Great. from old people. Nope. That older generation, like our parents and our grandparents, they've already figured out what they think about things. Yep. It's our generation and the, the, the Gen Zers and our kids generations. The, what do we say? They're alphas. They're Alpha. the ones that are going to be bringing about the change because this is the generation of using social media to be impactful and using our voice to mm-hmm. create um, social protests that that uh, that are very reminiscent of what happened during the civil rights movement. Like mm-hmm. we are having those protests again now. Yeah. Um, and again, why are we still having to do this? Why are we still having to do this? It's absolutely absurd. Agreed. Um, so I want to talk about, I want to talk about Rashad's dad um, because there's a very surprising element to the story. Um, So we know that he's a army soldier and he's a former officer. Um, And he keeps saying the whole, there's no better opportunity for a black boy in this country than to join the army. But we find out a little secret about him. Right. At the end. Yeah. We find out that the reason that his father left the police force is because he assaulted a black teenager, shot a black shot teenager him. yeah, who was actually the victim of a crime oh. and he paralyzed him. You froze again. Can you hear me now? Yep. I got you. All right. Tom, you're going to have to fix that again. So we find out that he shot a young black teenager who was the victim of a crime and he paralyzed him. Yeah. So how did that change your perspective of what his, of his dad at that point? It actually made me dislike him more. Mm-hmm. Like I already disliked his dad because of how he was treating Rashad. He right. is, I hate victim blaming in right. general. And right. he is automatically telling his kids not to make themselves like, yeah, stand out or, or right. dress like their peers or anything. Mm-hmm. And when this happens to Rashad, he instantly blames him. Right. He asks him what he did wrong. Right. This a grown man with a weapon, a mm-hmm. physically assaulted his son for no mm-hmm. reason other for than no tying reason. his shoe. He was tying his fucking shoe, and and looking for a cell phone in a bag. He wasn't. He was not no. doing anything wrong. And, and he actually was tripped over. Like, that woman right. tripped over him. Right. He was assaulted for mm-hmm. being black in a convenience store. That's exactly line. what happened. Exactly and what his happened. father then, as soon as his father comes to the hospital, he asks him if he was actually stealing. He right. blames his son instantly. Right. And not knowing Paul, the police officer, starts defending him. Right. And I think that's interesting that he chose to defend the police officer over Rashad, knowing that he had himself made the mistake. Of- I'm mad again, just thinking about it and reliving right. that story again. Right. I just. Yeah. I mean, he shot somebody who was being um, mugged. Like, yeah, he yeah. shot the victim. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we talk about these things happening so often. Um unfortunately so often where there's a mistaken identity where someone is charged uh, with a crime because, well, he had a black hoodie on and he was an African American and he was sagging his jeans. Okay. Well then that must be every, but every black person, right? Which right. It's not, it's, it's not. ridiculous. We need it to is. be more thorough in our descriptions. There are people that are, um, that have uh, given false testimony to yeah. put people in prison. Um, false, test, eyewitness testimony is very unreliable anyway, because the way especially you Especially in trauma. Changes. Right. 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 Um, but I, I think hearing this about Rashad's dad, it really changes the game of the story. Like it really changes. Um, How Rashad looks at his father. Right. But it t- changes who he's trying to make his son be. Right. So, um, so one of the things that, you know, he talks about, quote unquote, not dressing like a thug. And what he means by that is don't be wearing hoodies and wear it sagging your jeans. Which but every teenager wears. 
every teenager does. I mean, look at the movie Clueless from the 90s right. and talking about people sagging their jeans. And it wasn't just kids of color in that movie that were doing that. White right. kids were doing that too. Um, so since I work with teenagers, like I can tell you that this week uh, we had a discussion about dress code policy because, you know, we're starting the school year. So we're talking about dress code and it came up. Well, what if somebody's sagging their pants? Well, the, the rule is they can't show their underwear. So if a kid and I had students that did this in previous schools, if a student wears shorts under their under their pants uh-huh. and then underwear under those. So they're wearing actual like athletic shorts, yeah. not boxers, like um, these, like basketball shorts. Exactly. And they're sagging their jeans. And what you are seeing is their basketball shorts. They are not violating dress code. They're not showing their underwear. But sagging your pants is a cultural thing. Right. And if we are targeting people because they sag pants and wear hoodies, we're targeting a large population. We're targeting about half of this country. I mean, let's be honest. And Um, it's not just... I'm going to go on a tirade here for a second. It's not just for dress code. It's not just... Mm -hmm. um pocs Mm -hmm. women are targeted as well i've started following this tiktoker he's like 17 Mm -hmm. and he's in the alphabet mafia Mm -hmm. and he was has been for a week he's been wearing the same thing his female girlfriends have been wearing to school and he's not getting in trouble and he's not getting dress coded and they Mm -hmm. are and he's trying to show the hypocrisy in it and listen um, that that came up in our discussion as well and i'm really impressed with my principal he's he's new to our school this year and i'm new to our school this year and i have to say i'm really impressed with him because he straight up said i am not going to have a parent i'm not going he didn't say a parent he said i'm not going to uh fault a girl if the problem is the boys right and I well was like, and yes yes we, okay. <laughs> we make dress codes about teenage girls wearing spaghetti straps because yeah. their boobs are out and it's not because their boobs are out it is because it makes the grown men uncomfortable mm-hmm. and if you as a grown if, adult are sexualizing a teenager it is your problem it's your problem not the child and right. let's not make giving children body issues because right. you're uncomfortable and and there's always girls who are you know more well endowed in the chest area i have difficulty finding clothes that button up properly that's not my fault i'm not trying to wear tight clothes no i'm just busty i'm sorry i started having large i was a d by ninth grade that was not fun right god bless right. you by the way thank you <laughs> so moving on so yeah so this book i mean, is not about boobs sorry again. right no but i want to just say that in the case where you're blaming them well they shouldn't have dressed like that but you're making the argument that well if you're making that argument, then you're using that argument also for when people are raped, for example. Right. She, she was they asking for it. Me. Yeah. He was asking for it because he was stressed that way. That Don't is not even, okay. Do um, not do that. So it's not okay. I was in service. We all know this. This has been a thing. Mm-hmm. We have been told part of military sexual assault training, like, is we are told if we are to go out in town to take a, fem- a male shipmate with us. Because mm-hmm. if something happens, it's our own fault. Because we didn't go with a man. <laughs> I wish I was joking. Oh my gosh. That's pathetic. I was and, joking. And then, I, I and wish then, I was joking. And then what bothers me about that even more is that most of the assaults that happen with the military are between yep. members. Yep. And um, not you being assaulted while you're nope. on in port nope um if you see a male co-worker alone in a room don't go in that room i've mm-hmm. seen that in there um it's just i'm sure i'm hoping it has changed since i have exited the service but i'm mm-hmm. sure it hasn't changed that much i and- just feel like we need to stop trying to teach girls how to protect themselves from men and start teaching men men not to assault women that'd be great not things. to assault women That'd be fantastic. I'm really trying with my boys. We are working on raising men and not boys. Well, so, and 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 I also have white children. So my perspective with having boys is different because there are so many cases in this country that kid, uh, I cannot think of his name, but he raped a woman and he basically got out in a few that weeks. That Brock kid? Yeah, that Brock kid. And the, the the judge said, well, this will ruin his life. But someone else... No, shit, Sherlock! He ruined well, her life! He ruined her life! 
Um, and then there was a, 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 a college student who was a black, a young black man who had a similar charge, but was actually, I mean, it looked like he was probably innocent and he got the book thrown at him, like thrown at him. Actually, no, he was not a cho- a co- accused of rape. He was like accused of stealing, like, I don't know, bags of chips or something. It was like something ridiculous, but like the dichotomy of those punishments was ridiculous. It is. Um, and, and it is. And I know that I am raising boys who are white and they're men. And so they come from a place of privilege. Feminist by proxy. I've been telling this to Matthew Biggs since we got pregnant with Piper yeah. and we found out it was a girl. I was like, your job now is to be a feminist by proxy. Yeah. Yes. And I go, I'm not asking you to have all the rights of fe- like ideals of feminists. Mm-hmm. I know feminism can be hardcore for some people. But right. your job is to be an example in the world because right. our girls are going to look at you and say, this is our, what men are. Right. How are you going to act towards fem- other females? Right. How do you and, talk and, about them? And fortunately, we both have men in our lives. Like we have husbands who are good men in a storm and they are good at, at instilling in their children values um, like that. Like your husband is great at doing that with the girls and my He's husband is great at doing good that with girl the boys, dad so. which is hilarious yeah. since piper's the first girl in eight generations born into that family i think that's hilarious i, I mean i knew i was gonna have boys because the, the watkins family runs deep with boys so that I knew is that was one of five deep. boys <laughs> like yeah tom's one of four tom's yeah. one of four boys so okay and, back to all american so. boys all right. So Not our boys. I want to talk about the title, All American Boys. So it comes up several times that Quinn is an all American boy. Um, and then we talk, and that his father was an all American boy. And then we talk about this title, actually, maybe refers more to Rashad. So what do you right. think of when you think of the term All American Boy? I think of the 1950s Boy Scout. Yeah. You I know. think of the first astronauts, actually. Right. <laughs> and and obviously that image draws a white male, mm-hmm. right? Because clean cut. Clean cut. But if we're being honest, Rashad is having a more authentic American boy life. Mm-hmm. Rashad's story, sadly, is what is happening more frequently. Right. Not what's happening to Quinn. Not mm-hmm. what happens to, you know, boys, uh, Eagle Scout number seven. Like, mm-hmm. what is happening to Rashad right. is the American boy experience right now for POCs. And well, it's unacceptable. And I think that they they break down a lot of stereotypes in this book because when we think of um, people who live in, for lack of a better term, the hood, as both right. Quinn and Rashad do, we typically think mm-hmm. of people of color, yep. not necessarily black, but we typically think of people of color. Um, and we typically think that they come from broken homes and that they are not educated. And the complete opposite is true of right. Rashad's family. Um, whereas when we think of people who like Quinn's family, you know, he's white and he's the quote unquote all American boy. His dad's um, dead. Like his dad's dead. Like they're not a broken family because of choice. Like his dad's dead, but right. um, his mom isn't well educated. She doesn't. She have a leaves him alone job. constantly. They're alone. He's basically raising his younger brother. Right. So that dichotomy is broke. That uh, that um, stereotype is broken down of what we actually yeah. think of, and I absolutely love that Rashad Spoonie, his bro- Rashad's brother Spoonie, Spoonie. being a being an educated man uh having a great job and being and, and being engaged or dating uh, a future lawyer yeah um like i just think that there's just such a great breakdown of stereotypes in this book it was smart um but i will say it's not my favorite book on this topic okay it's not my favorite um so like i read the hate you give as well um okay. And I really think we should cover that one in the pod. I didn't pick that one because I wanted to read a new book. So this book was actually new mm-hmm. to both of us, um, which we have not really done. Um, and so that's why I picked this one. But The Hate You Give, also a banned book. Um, fantastic. I've met the author. Like, she, she's amazing. I love her so much. Um, but... Um, Excuse me. Uh, that book is only told from one person's perspective. Right. It's a a, a a teenage girl who's a black girl who lives in the hood and goes to a private school. Well, she witnesses her friend 
uh, being murdered by a police officer because mm-hmm. he reaches for his hairbrush. And um, like, we definitely need to cover that one on the pod, but that one is my, is my favorite of this like genre that I've yeah. read. And I think it's because you still get the dichotomy and you see her change. Like she witnesses this murder, but she goes to a school that's almost predominantly white. Like she's one of three kids in that school that's black. And the other one, one of them is her brother. Which is very common. Right. Right. And I think that um, I I liked the writing better in that one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've read Jason Reynolds before and I do like Jason Reynolds. I don't know if it was Brendan Keeley that was bothering me. I don't know. It just wasn't my favorite book of this genre. Is this, is this his first book though? This feels mm-hmm. like no. early writing. No. Um, no, I don't think so. I could look that up. We could Google we'll that and put that put in the it notes. In notes. But I don't think so. Um, Jason Reynolds, what he was kind of, what he's kind of best known for besides this book um, is the Into the Spider, Spider-Verse, the Spider-Man. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, this well, that's why this reads different then. This yeah. is a more serious topic. Right. Th- okay, so... But mostly, in a sense, mostly in a that's sense, what he writes is fiction like this. So, in a sense, this is his first novel. It's just his first novel in this kind of realm, right? No, if I mean, he's writing mo- Spider Verse mo- stuff. Well, most of what he writes is like all American Comics? boys. Oh, okay. No, it's like all American boys, but okay. I don't think it's his first one. I would have to look it up. But just looking at like the author note on the back flap. No, it's yeah. definitely not. He was awarded the um, 2015 Coretta Scott King John Steptoe Award for new talent for his debut novel, When I Was the Greatest. Okay. So this isn't the first. Even though this came out in 2015, he would have already won an award in 2015. So that means that his book had to be at least out for a year, probably two. Um, so not his first. Maybe it's just their. Um, I'm not sure they wrote well together. Right, I, I, I think, think the it's, their, it's, the, it's just the writing styles that aren't matching up for us. And I preferred the chapters that were about from per, for, from Rashad's perspective. Same. Like, I felt like Quinn was like whiny and I don't know. I got feel on my nerves. I don't know Quinn. I don't know. I was hoping his chapters would be over quickly. Um, yeah. But Quinn definitely has some PTSD. Like mm-hmm. in this book, you right. see that. Saturday when he's at the pizza place and the cops mm-hmm. show up and he starts panicking. Right. Like, right. That boy needs therapy. He's obviously going to need therapy. Right. Right. I mean, probably already needed therapy. He lost his dad. <laughs> right. Like, this just kicked it all off. Like he's, he's not in a good place. All right. So, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, um, the discussion on battle battle Royal, which is the first chapter of the book invisible man. Um, so this is a discussion that's happening in an English class. And the reason I want to oh, talk Ms. about Tracy. this. Tracy. Yeah. Miss Tracy. The reason I want to talk about this is because of what we talked about with To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, they, they have a discussion that she's not allowed to talk about this with them anymore because it will cause upheaval, continuous upheaval of what is happening. Right. Rashad is um, absent again today. Right. Yes, that's exactly it. The quote is Rashad is absent again today. It's been spray painted all around town. Um, people are it's starting a to hashtag on, on it's Instagram. A hashtag. People are wearing it on shirts. Like Rashad is absent today is a, is a big deal. Um, so I just want to say that the realization of um, this is why we need books like this. This is why right. we need to not ban books like this. Right. Because you're hiding you're hiding what is already happening in plain sight. Right. They're seeing it. It's mm-hmm. not like these kids aren't seeing it. And right. having a book like them, first and foremost, Miss Tracy crying felt like mm-hmm. a very real moment. Right. I agree. It felt very real because she couldn't do anything, but it was very right. apparent those kids could. Right. And her tears won were because she's obviously heartbroken about Rashad. Right. But and two, she's seeing that she is help raising and creating these children who are thoughtful and realize that they can change the world and all these mm-hmm. things and it's just it's gotta be overwhelming. I mean, I don't teach kids, but the impact a teacher can have on on someone's life is astounding. And I don't yeah. just mean that in a positive way. There are teachers who are impacting kids negatively. Agreed. Um, I hope I'm 
I hope and pray I've never been one of those teachers and that I am never one of those teachers that impacts yeah. a kid negatively because like I as a teacher I believe we pour love and joy into our students mm-hmm. we are our job is to help them hear a positive message and uh to know that that there is worth in them especially when a lot of them have negative voices in their own heads right um and so I hope I'm never one of those per- one of those teachers, but um, we can have an impact. We can have an impact either way. Yes. And I get the idea that Rashad was respected at school by his teachers. Yeah. He doesn't seem to have been a troublemaker. No. Um, he seems to have been a good kid. We know he's an artist. He doesn't seem to get in trouble. He kind of follows whatever he was his parents do. He's in ROTC. He yeah. like... Yeah, I I do think it's a little, uh, I think it's worth talking about his ROTC um, officer or teacher. I'm not really sure what they call them. His commanding officer, I think. Yeah, he sends him, he sends him basically like their creed as junior ROTC. Yeah. Um, Rashad's not sure what to do with that because he's not sure if he's accusing him of not being those things or if he's saying, I see that you are these things. I, I think it's the latter. I think he's saying, I have your back. I understand. Mm-hmm. We are here for you, right? Yeah. Because he, I think he knows Rashad, right? right? Because, right. what, they're sophomores in high school? Or juniors? juniors. I think they're juniors or seniors. So he's been in there. Recruiters right. Coming. So, so, I mean, he obviously knows who Rashad is by this point. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. had him for several years. Yeah. I, I think it's just a comment on him saying, I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. we we know who you are and i think that's like the general consensus at the school with mm-hmm. most you know with most of the teachers is yeah. they're like they're tired of seeing this happen to their kids you know because yeah. it is their kids too right and i have i have had students who not victims of police brutality but i have had students who have been victims of violence um and I just want to say, like, when teachers talk about loving their students as if they're their own kids, it's accurate. Like, I yeah, definitely I love my it. own kids more. Like, I'm not going to say that James and Sam are equal to my students, but I I didn't have kids for a long time while I was teaching, and they were my whole world. And when one of them is hurt or one of them is arrested or god forbid dies which i've had that too oh it god. breaks you it breaks right. you because it hurt, it's got to take a chunk out of your heart yeah. it has to it does it does um so, sorry back to the question which was i completely lost my train of thought <laughs> uh what you thought about um the discussion with miss tracy's class in battle royal i don't even I know think if i, I actually am- asked it as a question <laughs> I, I, I mean i think i covered that yeah i think so um oh what else um they end up having a protest right police are gearing up like if this is going to be a riot i thought the end of this book was beautiful i think so too um i do think that sometimes protests get out of hand and do become riots and so i don't really totally fault the police for being prepared for that but i do fault them for um for being overreacting they're they're aggressively prepared like you right. don't need to drive tanks down the, down the street down the street but like, i think was it ridiculous. was a scare tactic it was a scare tactic yeah they were trying to deter because it was mostly teenagers right, right. it right. is the teens and the college kids of town getting together and having this peaceful protest and they were trying to scare these kids out of making the statement which right. is awful because the right to gather and protest is part of our constitutional it's rights the, it's the first of our constitutional rights so i mean i thought this i wrote the end of this book is beautiful the two boys connecting is in the final moments but this isn't always how real life works mm-hmm. i i'm glad they ended it on a happier note yeah but because you know, stories do need a happy ending, but sadly, that is not right. how things like this really go down in real life. Right. We don't. We don't get to the point where Paul is a facing is facing 
you know, a trial, right. um, which a lot of times what's happening in these cases is um, there's a, a, an incredible level of protection for our police officers that, um, which they need it. I'm not right. saying that they don't. There are great police officers who are accused of things that they did not do. And so having right. these protections in place. But there are, are also their job. But there trash are also can. Cops. There are there trash are can officers, officers right. that are just <clears throat> abusing the badge. Right. I want to talk about uh, Mrs. Ehrlich, who's their uh, trigonometry teacher. Okay. Uh, Quinn's trigonometry teacher. Um, she writes some things on the board, and I love her quote after. So I want to read the things she writes on the board. In 2012, in the United Kingdom, the number, number of people, regardless of race, shot and killed by police officers, one. In 2013, in the United Kingdom, the number of times police officers fired guns in the line of duty, the number slash the number of people fatally shot, Three, three times they fired, zero people were shot fatally. In the United States, in the seven-year period ending in 2012, a white police officer killed a black person nearly two times a week. And this is her quote. I'm not much of a talker, you know that, but I know numbers. The numbers don't lie, kids. The numbers always tell a story. That is, I have chills reading it because... It's so truthful. It is is so, so honest if you are in this country we do have fans that are not in this country but if we are if you are in this country if you are in the united states and you do not see how the system is stacked against people of color yeah if you do not see systemic racism if you do not see how people of color are targeted more often than white people you're part of the problem you are part of the problem Part of the you problem. Need, you need to read books like this one and get your house in order. Word. Word. Um, did you have anything that you uh, wanted to talk about with this book? Um, I want to talk about Rashad's nurse. Okay. Um, I loved great. her. Uh, she was honest about how uncomfortable she was. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Which most people in that situation wouldn't. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, she was very truthful with Rashad about how she doesn't know how to handle this situation. Mm-hmm. Right? She's right. seen the news. She tried being quiet. And then Rashad had that meltdown with the remote. And, like, she's like, okay. Right. Let, let's, let, let's do something else. And right. she got him to draw. And, right. you know, and she pulled him out of... She asked him why he, they didn't have faces. Right. And this whole... Making them faceless was mm-hmm. just, it was a good metaphor for what's going on in the world, mm-hmm. right? Like, right. And then when he put his face on it and left it for her, mm-hmm. it was, was definitely just, a statement. It was a statement, right? Showing mm-hmm. she had an impact, right? Mm-hmm. Showing yeah. she was an ally in the situation, in that time. Right. right. And, but also helping him realize who he was. Yeah, and I mean, she switches shifts so that she's with him the entire time he's in the hospital. He's in the hospital for like a week. Yeah. Um, she didn't have to do that. No, she, she sure did didn't. She did it because uh, she saw what care he needed and she knew she could provide right. it. Right. Um, and there are other people that come to his aid um, at the end of the story. The, um, um, the woman, the elderly the woman, woman that works in the gift shop. Yes, she talks to him about how... She has a beautiful speech about... Right. Um, her brother was at Selma. Right, and that she didn't go. And she, and didn't she go. just lives with regret, right? Right. And, um, and then we also have the woman that falls over Rashad. Um, she agrees to testify right. on his behalf. Right. She was there. And something that kept playing in my mind the entire time that I was reading this book was, why is nobody looking for the footage of the camera inside the store because ever talk about that no and my assumption is this is just me filling with my brain my assumption is is like most convenience stores in those kinds of areas where there is low income they have cameras but they don't work they don't work yeah or they're not recording or they're not plugged in they're just there as a threat right right I mean, and we had that at the library where I worked. It, it, we had non-working care cameras for half of my career there. <laughs> oh, it's just yeah, a threat. It's meant to be a threat, yeah. I just was surprised that no one even, like, brought that up. Because if you would have looked at that tape, I mean, it wouldn't have changed what Paul did to Rashad. No. But no. it would have, like, 
put everybody on Rashad's side because it was right. very obvious that he didn't do anything wrong. Right. Um, I do want to mm-hmm. say that the audiobook is very good. Um, okay. It was. Do they, two, do they use two dual authors? narrators? Okay. Um, Guy Lockhart and Keith Nobbs. Mm-hmm. Nobbs and O B B S. Nobbs, Nobbs. I'm sorry, dude. Um, um, I'll put their IMDb pages in okay. uh, the notes, but they were really okay. good. And then uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see the New York Times article I put in my notes, but that was I found oh, that no, really I interesting. Um, I'll put that in there too. It has a interesting take on this, and this article is from 2015, so okay. when the book came out, when the book came and, out, and it's still, I feel like it's still relevant the part to the part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, uh- and I'll definitely, I'll definitely read that too. And we'll, we'll put a link to below. Um, I did want to say, I love how they did the quote unquote die in at the end of yeah. the protest. Yeah. And um, Spoonie's girlfriend reads the list of people that have, her name is, what is her name? Barry. Barry. She reads the list of people who have died as a result of police brutality. And the audience repeats, is absent name. again today. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's people's names that you would know people. Um, yeah. it's, it's people that you've heard about, um, this happening to Tamir mm-hmm. Rice is on here, for example, Aina um, Jones, Freddie Gray, right. Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and they are, they, they will are be absent. That we've heard of. Yeah. And, and they will be, be absent. absent again today. They will. Yeah. And, and, um, and unfortunately we now have more names we can add to that list. Yep. Um, for Six sure. Years later, mm-hmm. and we will keep having that. And honestly, I think that's the point of this hashtag. Um, if you go to Twitter, the hashtag Rashad is absent again today is used by it kids. Is. Oh wow, that's amazing. Um, but I think other than highlighting br- police brutality and the life of a POC. I think books like this are helping our kids become political in Mm -hmm. a healthy way. Right. Learning that you can protest. Learning you're allowed to have an opinion, even as a teenager. Because I was told to sit down and shut up when I saw the news back then. Well, and 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 even when I had opinions. And I think on both sides of the aisle, we have adults who don't want kids to realize that they have a voice. And that is very unfortunate. Um, and speaking from the right side of the aisle where I sit, I know we've talked about this before that we're on opposite sides of the aisle wh- where I sit. If you are a Republican and you are saying, we don't want kids to read books like this because we don't want them to, you know, you're protest, muting them. You need them to want to protest. Yeah. Like this is, o- this is not okay to allow this to still continue to happen. And you want, future leaders of your party on both sides of the aisle to be people who stand for something. Right. Right. Like Burr, if you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? for, Right. Right. Uh, So I I just watched Hamilton again. So we got to throw that in there. I mean, it's true though. Like when the election was going on, Mm -hmm. we watched uh, all the, debates with the kids Mm -hmm. right and then we watched sorry i have something in my eye we watched the commentary um from when it was live from the channel we were watching it on but then Mm -hmm. we went later to youtube and watched other channels commentary so the girls saw the different variations of the spectrum Mm -hmm. and then we went to npr where there's always a like median for the most part, I media. do not agree with that. I do not agree with that. NPR is left leaning. For the most part, yes, but no, there are. It, it, yeah, Anyways. I would say I would say the most neutral you could get is the BBC because they're not involved right. in our politics. But my kids formed an opinion based off of the way the humans were talking, not the people behind the microphones. They right. were. Jud- making judgments, their own personal judgments, based off of the people behind the podium, not the people recording. And and, and shouldn't that be our goal for our children? Right. right. Shouldn't it's that be our goal? Let them form an opinion. Right. Let them form an opinion. It now, doesn't have to be your opinion. I, I personally grew up in a family 
that of Democrats. And when I went to register to vote and my grandmother, I think she was joking. So my grandmother told me that she would disown me if I registered as a Republican because I come from a family of blue collar workers, which and union workers, which means that I have to be a Democrat. And I told her, I love you, Grandma, and I hope you'll still love me, which of course she did. I was her favorite person. Like, of course right. I was. She was my best friend. But I said, you know, I believe in smaller government. And that's really what it comes down to for me. I believe in smaller government. And I've said this before. I'm registered as a Republican, but I'm more of a libertarian because I truly believe do what you want and just leave me out of it. Like, leave the right. government out of it. Leave me out of it. I don't care. Word. Do what you Word. want. Just stop intervening in my life right you right. stop intervening in my life you don't want me in your life don't get in my life like right right exactly um and so i do think we should on both sides of the aisle encourage our kids to be thinkers for themselves and that's why books like um, this are important and this is why books like this are important and that's why we need and to stop banning fucking books let them read banning books. <laughs> and in the to kill a mockingbird episode we talked about how you could present two books um that would give the same, like, this would be a great unit doing yes. To Kill a Mockingbird and All American Boys Together or To Kill a Mockingbird and The Hate You Give. I think you'd get more flack from parents about The Hate You Give because there's a lot more cursing in it. Like, it is definitely more grungy um, yeah. where this one isn't as grungy. But um, I feel like the violence in this is pretty intense. I, that, But it only happens in that one scene. Right. And, uh, the hate you give has violence throughout the whole gotcha. thing. <laughs> it's all, the whole thing has violence in it. Um, I love that book. Like I said, it's it's definitely a favorite of mine. Um, but uh, I think that this one would make a good uh, unit, um, a comparison contrast unit. And you could talk about about what it means you know, on both sides of the uh, not political spectrum, but I mean – you know, the dichotomy between being a person right. of color and being a person who's white. Um, right. So, um, anything else you want to add, Molly? No. This episode was a downer, but, I mean, it has to be. I, I, I actually think, though, even though we don't have, like, the witty banter that we sometimes have, like, I feel like this episode was important. Uh, agreed, um, 100%. And, and um, uh, guys, we I, will get back to our normal stuff, but this stuff is important, too. Maybe we should just not let April pick books anymore. No! <laughs> this was important, April. And I loved the... I, I am glad I read this book. I am glad this was on the list, and I mm -hmm. want everyone to read it. And I think you need to read it with your teens and your tweens. Yeah. And it is I think you'd be a good one for... I think it'd be a good one for you to add into your curriculum with Piper this year. Um, I actually am going to give it to her after we're done with um, our body and covering yeah. that shit. So <laughs> so next week we are reading another kind of a downer of a book. We are reading 13 Reasons, Reasons Why, Why by Jay Asher. This is a more um, pop culture book, though. Yeah, so... Uh, we often cover books that have been made into film or TV and all American boys is not one of those, but this one was made into a Netflix series. I have a lot of feelings on the Netflix series. Same. Um, but uh, 13 reasons why will be next week with Jay Asher by Jay Asher. Um, and uh, that will, that will be, is that our last band? band book? It is. is and then we go right but, into Frankenstein. Yeah. So we'll wrap up band books week next week. Our Band Books Month next week. And then we will jump into our spooky reads, which Molly will host. And our first one is Frankenstein, um, which obviously horror classic. So definitely, it is. Mary definitely Shelley. get that read. Um, all right. So, Molly, I love you. I love you. Thanks besties, for joining us, I love you guys. Yes. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, we, I really enjoyed the feedback we're getting. So please yep. keep that coming. Oh, also... Um, uh, I think we're going to do two episodes for Harry Potter gang. Oh. <laughs> I am about halfway through the Half-Blood Prince. I think this is probably one of the worst. Like it's got, I, I hope it picks up at some point, man, this book is awful. <laughs> um, it's still not as bad as the first one, but nope. oh my gosh. Oh, April. I love you. Bestie. <laughs> Don't forget to like subscribe and share all the things. Do the things. We'll see you guys next week. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on Book Besties. Don't forget to like and subscribe. The views discussed here are those of Molly and April, not those of anyone else. Today's book was All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. 
Your book besties are Molly Biggs and April Watkins. Editing by Thomas Watkins. And music is Sweet Sweet Sleep Sweetly by Prigida. Don't forget to follow Book Besties on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you would like to contact the Book Besties, please email us at bookbestiespod at gmail.com.